Reginald on Christmas presents. I wish it to be distinctly understood, said Reginald, that I don't want a George Prince of Wales prayer book as a Christmas present. The fact cannot be too widely known. There ought, he continued, to be technical education classes on the science of present giving. No one seems to have the faintest notion of what anyone else wants, and the prevalent ideas on the subject are not creditable to a civilised community. There is, for instance, the female relative in the country, who knows a tie is always useful, and sends you some spotted horror that you could only wear in secret, or in Tottenham Court Road. It might have been useful had she kept it to tie up currant bushes with, when it would have served the double purpose of supporting the branches and frightening away the birds, for it is an admitted fact that the ordinary Tom Tit of commerce has a sounder aesthetic taste than the average female relative in the country. Then there are aunts. They are always a difficult class to deal with in the matter of presents. The trouble is that one never catches them really young enough. By the time one has educated them to an appreciation of the fact that one does not wear red woollen mittens in the West End, they die, or quarrel with the family, or do something equally inconsiderate. That is why the supply of trained aunts is always so precarious. There is my Aunt Agatha, par exemple, who sent me a pair of gloves last Christmas, and even got so far as to choose a kind that was being worn, and had the correct number of buttons. But they were nines. I sent them to a boy whom I hated intimately. He didn't wear them, of course, but he could have. That was where the bitterness of death came in. It was nearly as consoling as sending white flowers to his funeral. Of course, I wrote and told my aunt that they were the one thing that had been wanting to make existence blossom like a rose. I'm afraid she thought me frivolous. She comes from the north, where they live in the fear of heaven and the Earl of Durham. Aunts with a dash of foreign extraction in them are the most satisfactory in the way of understanding these things. But if you can't choose your aunt, it is wisest in the long run to choose the present and send her the bill. Even friends of one's own set, who might be expected to know better, have curious delusions on the subject. I am not collecting copies of the cheaper editions of Omar Khayyam. I gave the last four that I received to the lift boy, and I like to think of him reading them with Fitzgerald's notes to his aged mother. Lift boys always have aged mothers. Show such nice feeling on their part, I think. Personally, I can't see where the difficulty in choosing suitable presents lies. No boy who had brought himself up properly could fail to appreciate one of those decorative bottles of liqueurs that are so reverently staged in Morrill's window. And it wouldn't in the least matter if one did get duplicates. And there would always be the supreme moment of dreadful uncertainty whether it was creme de menthe or chartreuse, like the expectant thrill on seeing your partner's hand turned up at bridge. People may say what they like about the decay of Christianity. The religious system that produced green chartreuse can never really die. And then, of course, there are liqueur glasses, and crystallized fruits, and tapestry curtains, and heaps of other necessaries of life that make really sensible presents, not to speak of luxuries, such as having one's bills paid, or getting something quite sweet in the way of jewellery. Unlike the alleged good woman of the Bible, I am not above rubies. When found, by the way, she must have been rather a problem at Christmas time. Nothing short of a blank cheque would have fitted the situation. Perhaps it's as well that she's died out. The great charm about me, concluded Reginald, is that I am so easily pleased. But I draw the line at a Prince of Wales prayer book. Reginald's Christmas Revel They say, 
said Reginald, that there's nothing sadder than victory, except defeat. If you've ever stayed with dull people during what is alleged to be the festive season, you can probably revise that saying. I shall never forget putting in a Christmas at the Babwolds. Mrs. Babwold is some relation of my father's, a sort of to-be-left-till-called-for cousin, and that was considered sufficient reason for my having to accept her invitation at about the sixth time of asking, though why the sins of the father should be visited by the children. You won't find any notepaper in that drawer. That's where I keep old menus and first-night programmes. Mrs. Babwold wears a rather solemn personality and has never been known to smile, even when saying disagreeable things to her friends or making out the stores list. She takes her pleasures, sadly. A state elephant at a Durbar gives one a very similar impression. Her husband gardens in all weathers. When a man goes out in the pouring rain to brush caterpillars off rose trees, I generally imagine his life indoors leaves something to be desired. Anyway, it must be very unsettling for the caterpillars. Of course, there were other people there. There was a major somebody who had shot things in Lapland, or somewhere of that sort. I forget what they were, but it wasn't for want of reminding. We had them cold with every meal, almost, and he was continually giving us details of what they measured from tip to tip, as though he thought we were going to make them warm under things for the winter. I used to listen to him with a rapt attention that I thought rather suited me. And then one day I quite modestly gave the dimensions of an okapi I had shot in the Lincolnshire Fens. The Major turned a beautiful Tyrian scarlet. I remember thinking at the time that I should like my bathroom hung in that colour. And I think that at that moment he almost found it in his heart to dislike me. Mrs. Babwold put on a first aid to the injured expression— and asked him why he didn't publish a book of his sporting reminiscences. It would be so interesting. She didn't remember till afterwards that he had given her two fat volumes on the subject, with his portrait and autograph as a frontispiece, and an appendix on the habits of the Arctic muscle. It was in the evening that we cast aside the cares and distractions of the day, and really lived— cards were thought to be too frivolous and empty a way of passing the time, so most of them played what they called a book game. You went out into the hall, to get an inspiration, I suppose, then you came in again with a muffler tied round your neck and looked silly, and the others were supposed to guess that you were Wee McGregor. I held out against the inanity as long as I decently could, but at last, in a lapse of good nature, I consented to masquerade as a book, only I warned them that it would take some time to carry out. They waited for the best part of forty minutes, while I went and played wine-glass skittles with the page-boy in the pantry. You play it with a champagne cork, you know, and the one who knocks down the most glasses without breaking them wins. I won, with four unbroken out of seven. I think William suffered from over-anxiousness— they were rather mad in the drawing-room at my not having come back, and they weren't a bit pacified when I told them afterwards that I was at the end of the passage. "'I never did like Kipling,' was Mrs. Babwold's comment, when the situation dawned upon her. "'I couldn't see anything clever in Earthworms Out of Tuscany. Or is that by Darwin?' "'Of course these games are very educational,' but personally I prefer bridge. On Christmas evening we were supposed to be specially festive, in the old English fashion. The hall was horribly draughty, but it seemed to be the proper place to revel in, and it was decorated with Japanese fans and Chinese lanterns, which gave it a very old English effect. A young lady, with a confidential voice, favoured us with a long recitation about a little girl who died— or did something equally hackneyed, and then the Major gave us a graphic account of a struggle he had had with a wounded bear. I privately wished that the bears would win sometimes on these occasions. At least they wouldn't go vaporing about it afterwards. Before we had time to recover our spirits, we were indulged with some thought-reading by a young man whom one knew instinctively 
had a good mother and an indifferent tailor. The sort of young man who talks unflaggingly through the thickest soup, and smooths his hair dubiously, as though he thought it might hit back. The thought-reading was rather a success. He announced that the hostess was thinking about poetry, and she admitted that her mind was dwelling on one of Austin's odes, which was near enough. I fancy she had been really wondering whether a scrag-end of mutton and some cold plum pudding would do for the kitchen dinner next day. As a crowning dissipation, they all sat down to play progressive Halma, with milk chocolate for prizes. I've been carefully brought up, and I don't like to play games of skill for milk chocolate, so I invented a headache and retired from the scene. I had been preceded a few minutes earlier by Miss Langshan Smith, a rather formidable lady, who always got up at some uncomfortable hour in the morning, and gave you the impression that she had been in communication with most of the European governments before breakfast. There was a paper pinned on her door, with a signed request that she might be called particularly early on the morrow. <laughs> Such an opportunity does not come twice in a lifetime. I covered up everything, except the signature, with another notice, to the effect that, before these words should meet the eye, she would have ended a misspent life, was sorry for the trouble she was giving, and would like a military funeral. A few minutes later— I violently exploded an air-filled paper bag on the landing, and gave a stage moan that could have been heard in the cellars. Then I pursued my original intention, and went to bed. The noise those people made in forcing open the good lady's door was positively indecorous. She resisted gallantly, but I believe they searched her for bullets for about a quarter of an hour, as if she had been in historic battlefield. I hate travelling on Boxing Day, but one must occasionally do things that one dislikes. You've been listening to a bite-sized audiobook, read by Simon Stanhope. For more stories like this, please try the links below. And do click subscribe and hit the bell to hear about future uploads. You may also be interested in becoming a channel member. There are a few options available with various benefits. Click the Join button to find out more. This recording is copyright Bite Sized Audio 2021. Thank you for listening.